Awesome. In the name of Jesus, there is victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Right now, right here. Awesome. God is good, amen? Amen. All right. So let's get into the word. Let's have a small word of prayer before we get in. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We give thanks and praise for you, O Lord. Thank you for what you are doing in our lives. We open ourselves for you, teacher. Teach us your ways. Teach us your will. Teach us your word. So we can follow you and receive more of your revelation, God, and more of your power working in our lives. We bless you, we honor you, and we praise you for that, God. Your will be done in our lives as it is in heaven. Your name alone shall be magnified and glorified. Into your precious hands we submit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. We started our Bible study. The Bible, the title of my message, the, the title of this Bible study is anointed versus ex-anointed. Ex-anointed versus anointed. The word anointed comes from a, a Greek term, cryo, and uh, which would mean which would mean the anointing or the anointed. And uh, it simply means overflow of Christ through our lives, through us. But I would like to study the gifts or the anointing of the Lord is irrevocable. God is not going to back off once he anoints us. But can we walk away from it? That's a different story. You know, many times we blame God for our mistakes. You know, God, why did you leave me? Why God, God, why God, why? Where are you, God? All these kinds of questions, we have them. But in reality, uh, those are the questions that we need to ask ourselves. So we, we have to question ourselves, did we leave God anywhere? And did we step away any time? Instead of trying to blame God, many times, I, I heard this over and over, that I tried, it didn't work. I tried, it didn't work. Or where was God when I was going through this? I heard all those things. But I want us to take a step back and understand certain things. You know, Bible clearly says this thing. In all you're getting, get understanding. We have to get understanding. That's why as a church, many times uh, uh, we are good at believing. We are good at believing, which is good. But what God needs us is to for somebody to understand it. And Bible even offers us, by faith you will understand also. But when you have understanding, many times that's the problem. Understanding simply to, if I have to define it in a simple format, how to. How to do it. Many times we miss it. We, many times we know what to do it. But we don't know how to do it. You know, we have to learn it through. You know, we know there is an anointing. And we know we can walk away from the anointing. How can we walk away from it? Or how can we walk under the anointing? These are the things that I want to ponder on. And when we, the more we study it, I believe that's going to explain to us, um, that's what my prayer is, that we will be able to understand more of the value of the anointing that is upon your life. There is a unique anointing upon every individual here. You are the anointed. That situation, you are the anointed husband, you are the anointed wife, you are the anointed father, you are the anointed son. You have to take ownership of that anointing. When we do not take ownership of that anointing, we are struggling by ourselves. God doesn't want us to do that. And God didn't ask for you to do that. That is why he was giving you the anointing. 
You know, when, someone, when we send the, the military to fight for us, we empower them. We give them all kinds of things. We give them the clothing. We give them the armor. We give them the, the guns, the bullets, whatever it is. That we give them so that they can stand and represent and fight for us. And nobody is asking, uh, okay, go find your gun. Go find your sword. Go find your helmet. Go find those things. That's not how it operates. We give them. This is a mission that was given to us by God. So if God has given that mission, God is empowering us with his anointing to fulfill that mission. And that's where many of us fail as Christians. We often try to step into it, try to do it ourselves. And that's where God keeps giving us the warning, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. He keeps giving that warning to us. It is not going to be by your strength, by your effort, by your capacity, by your understanding. It's a good thing that you have those things. But they can only take you so far. So God wants us to rely on his anointing. I, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited for these end days. One of the reasons I see is, Many times we do not, we are not seeing that these these days. But in the book of in the in the book of Acts, we see one of the uh, early apostles or the disciples. He outruns a, a chariot. Imagine that. He outruns a chariot. A, a normal person on his feet. He doesn't have Harley Davidson. He was running on his own. And he outruns a chariot. How could he do that? That's because of the spirit of the Lord that, ha that was upon him. And those are the signs and wonders that are ought to happen more often these days. You know, I'm not trying to be creepy here, but I'm trying to encourage us to, be, to have our rightful position. That is our rightful position. God can do those things. God did those things. And why should we stop believing those things? That's exactly what God wants us to have as, a, as an ex expectation these days. I don't know about you. My faith, I am building my faith every day. Every time I see sign of a death scenario, death situation, I want to run into it. There were times I would go lay hands on dead people on purpose because I am training myself to see the resurrection of the Lord, the resurrection power of God working. If Jesus was able to raise somebody after three days, you and me who believe in him, that's what Jesus said, if you believe in me, greater works than, than me. You know, if I preach this thing, many of the, many people think I'm nuts. But that's not what I'm trying. I'm going to the Bible. I'm going to what Jesus has said. And if you have a red Bible, it is written in red. Jesus said it, not me. I didn't make up these things. He said it. So now you have an opportunity to believe it and access it and have them on this earth. We can be passive. You know, yesterday we were watching a show. There was, a, in that show, there was one stunt line uh, that I just, it have, it have bombarded me in there. And in there, this, this, this uh, 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 girl says something. God gives the information. He doesn't give me the end result. So th this seems a little complicated, but I, I totally got what she was saying. God gives us the information. So the, the, the information is here for us. Can we run with it? End result is not in his hands. It is in our hands. That you may inherit is what he says. That you may inherit. May is what he uses. Not you will. Why he uses may is not because he is not going to do that. But he doesn't. He is, he, are you sure you will go that far? Are you sure you will carry it till the end? 
God needs people who are willing to carry it till the end. Paul and Peter, they saved, man, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people came to Christ. At the end, when they were leaving, they weren't talking about how many people got saved through them. They weren't even talking about how many people got healed through them. They weren't talking about how many cities they went to. They weren't talking about anything but one thing. One thing they say is, I kept, I, I, I fought my fight. And I held my faith. Those are the things they were boasting about. And that's exactly what you and me can do. If those people, it is not just Jesus, you see people being resurrected even after that. I, we are becoming numb to those things. Because we are not counting on the anointing factor. We are counting on us. We are only, we are only looking at things in two dimensions. Human limitation. That's where I am trying to build us into a point where we stop depending on our two dimension and go into the multi-dimension of God. The multi-possibilities of God. That's where we have to go into. That's why God gave the anointing. Yes, without any doubt, you cannot resurrect a, a dead person. But your anointing can. Amen? Your anointing can do that. Yes, you cannot heal a person. But your anointing can. Yes, you cannot set free anybody. But your anointing can. We need to count more on that anointing than ourselves. The main difference that I've, I'm going to explore now, ex-anointed, is the person who walked away and walked in himself. Walked with his ability. Rather than walking with God's ability. God's empowerment. That's what ex-anointed is. The anointed person, what did he do is, he continues to walk under God's anointing. He continues to humble himself under God's power. He was foolish enough to say, I'll do anything. I can do anything. That's how the story goes. I'm just giving you the prelude of thing. But I, I, I would like for us to explore on this so much that we, uh, by the end of the Bible study, this is my prayer, that we as a church become stronger in believing our anointing. Not what you can do, what your intelligence is. I appreciate that. But I want your anointing. God needs your anointing. Because that's what he distributed. That's what he split. So when all that anointings are coming together, whoa, corporate anointing. That's what we did just a moment ago. We all came together and we were speaking it, man. We were speaking the healing of God. We were speaking it and devil has to flee. Because the anointing is coming together, the anti-Christ, the anti-anointed has to flee. When we do not come together, we are empowering the Antichrist. The sickness, sickness is anti-anointed. That doesn't have anointing. That's why Jesus clear. That's why the Word of God clearly says, "No weapon, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper." It doesn't have the ability to prosper against us, because you're anointed. It cannot touch you. That's where God clearly gives an instruction, do not touch my anointed. He's not just talking to the people, he's even telling the whole realms. Angels be scared to touch us because we are anointed. The devil will be scared to touch us because we are anointed. The problem is we don't walk in at our anointing, so obviously we are opening our doors for the devil to run us. Every time we are falling down, every time something is attacking us, get back into the anointing. Every time, think of this thing. I see the, there was a time, there, there was a time I was watching a show on uh, 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 National Geographic Channel. And uh, when I was watching this, there is this lion. They were trying to hunt the lion. 
And there were people who hit, hit an arrow on it. And it took the first shot. And after the first shot, it kept pouncing. It kept, kept coming. It kept throwing its paw. It kept, it was trying still to get the person. And they, they did another. They did three, four. It still kept fighting and fighting and fighting. And that's what he says when he talks about being lion. The lion of Judah. He doesn't, he doesn't give up. I like the beautiful portrayal in the movie Narnia. How they portrayed the lion. That's the most beautiful uh, uh, depiction of the lion of Judah. He walks into it as if everything got stripped. And the next thing we know, the very thing that he's trying to bury it, gives in. It breaks up. That, that, that whole thing breaks off. That's a, that's a beautiful depiction. Bless God for C.S. Lewis who was able to see that. And uh, that's what we have to carry. The spirit of lion. We are not giving up. Just because, you know, something hit us. We have to continue to fight. That lion ended up dying. But we do not. Because we have life eternal in us. That's what we have to count on. The anointing that you carry on is not for a day. That's what God said. It's irrevocable. I'm not going to take it off from you. You're going to have it throughout the eternity. You know, when you go to heaven, many of us have poor expectations about heaven. We think it's going to be all just coming to us. We just relax and it's just going to come and people will be catering onto us and all those things. But I'm going to tell you something. If God is asking us to walk by faith here, you will be walking by faith there too. If we are, if we, God is asking us to call those things that they were not, as though they were, we are going to be doing the same thing there too. That's the lifestyle he wants us to build. He wants us to get used to heaven on earth. Not just the earthly life here. We are bringing heaven. We are getting accustomed to where we are going. Before I came to the United States, in India, I never wore seat belt in my whole life. I never wore a helmet. That's a different story <laughs> when I was riding on my motorcycle. But when I knew God is leading me to come here, that's when I started adapting to it immediately. Because I know where I am going. If you know where you are going, you will act like one. If you know you are going to heaven, you will act like the citizen of heaven, not the citizen of the earth. You will prepare for that. You will adapt to it. You will have it. I never ate beef in my whole life. But I started eating beef because I know that's what you eat here. I, I started learning all these things. I started adapting those things. When I came here, lifestyle wasn't that hard for me because I prepared. We ought to prepare for where we are going rather than we are. We, we, that's, that's what is called laziness. We just want to be where we are. And we call it comfort zone, but I call it lazy zone. We are not going anywhere. And the Bible calls them as foolish virgins. That's a different story. But today, I would like for us to start this thing. Anytime I'm, I'm going to study on this anointing and ex-anointing using examples of the life of Saul, the first king of Israel, and David. Those are the two people I believe will give a great depiction of what, what ex-anointing is and what is anointing. They'll show us how, how they operate. Now, I like to do the comparative study between them both, but in the format, in through the anointing, I don't care for their personalities. You know, everybody has their own personality. Don't you have a personality? Everyone has a personality. But I, I care for is the anointing. How did they treat what God has given them? Personality may have come from my dad, my personality. I don't know. <laughs> But anointing came from my upper. Amen? So, 
um, every story, we have to understand the premise of the story for us to understand the story well. If you don't understand this, it's like, okay, what did we watch now? You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it, it ends up being Inception. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, it took a while for people to understand that. But anyway, um, because which dream they're talking about, they don't even know which dream they're talking about. There is a dream, and then there is a dream, and then there is a dream in there. So anyway, <coughs> I would like for us to go to the first Samuel, starting at eighth chapter. The starting of this story, the, the beginning of this story, I would like to take the first person that we want to consider in this whole plot is Samuel. Uh, uh, for 8th chapter, starting at 8th chapter. 1 Samuel, 8th chapter. Samuel. I'm not going to go into the details of Samuel's story, but Samuel is so important for these two people, two things that go on. The reason is, what is Samuel's calling? He is a prophet. Prophet in the Old Testament simply means the voice of God. Samuel comes to the picture first. You know, when you really study this story, that's so amazing. God didn't go directly into David. God starts with Samuel. And this is a place for us to pause and think for a moment, just for a moment. How does God heal us? Many times as Christians, when we expect healing from God, we expect a miracle. We expect a bombard from God. We expect a touch from God. But the word of God clearly says, He sent His word and healed them. So before you will have a manifestation, what comes first is the word. First comes the word. When we do not uh, have faith or when we do not have a connection to the word we will not have a connection to any of the manifestations many people miss that connection they are expecting the healing but the connecting to that healing is through the word heaven and earth will not pass away uh, heaven and earth might pass away but my healing will never pass away is that what he said my words will never pass away. And he says, he doesn't even talk about the healing or even salvation. I exalted my word above my name. Even above his presence, even about his, above his reputation, anything, his word is exalted. His word has been given that much of a prominence. Even by God himself. How much more you and me ought to do? Instead of trying to figure out where am I going to have this answer? How is God going to open this door? How is God going to work? Seek his word. This was a generation where people left the voice of God. Where people left the word of God. And this prophet, the reason he is important so much is... He is the one who invoked anointing upon Saul and David. He is the same person. Anointing was released through him. So can I deduce it like this? Anointing is released through the word of God. If we are speaking the word of God, we are releasing the anointing of God. If we are speaking our own words, we are releasing our strength. That's what we say. Oh, it's not going to work out. This is never going to work. This is never going to happen. What are we doing? We are speaking our words. 
But in that place, if we bring the word of God, what are we doing? We are speaking the anointing. We are bringing the power of God into existence. And that's what, has, what, what happens here. The anointing of the Lord was spoken into their lives. He invokes them. He anoints them both. He releases the anointing of the Lord on both of them. And the reason I am looking at this picture, I can show so many things here. I want to equate Samuel to God. If God is there, he is the same one who anointed Adam. And he is the same one who anointed Jesus. All right. Adam is the first, first one, first anointed one, first Adam. And when it comes to Jesus, he is the last Adam. That's what the Bible talks about him. He's not the second Adam, but he is the last. So what happened here is the anointing that have come to Adam or Saul in this case. Did not go to the full, full potential of what it ought to be. That's why what God did was he sent forth Christ. Jesus. And uh, like I said last week, law is the first one that is sent to us. And then there is grace. What, what God have empowered them to do, they did not do. And instead, they started taking control. They started operating outside of their zone. Their ability. And then in that, they always end up in trouble. Whoever followed this pattern, they always see failure. Whoever followed this pattern, they always saw success. Even before David, Abraham followed this pattern. Even before law was there, they followed this pattern. So they were able to see continual success in their life. The people who follow, followed law, and even now, even after grace, people follow the law. And still see the same thing, failure. Amen. Alright, I'm going to start today. <laughs> Now it came to pass, 8th chapter, first verse. Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Look at this, that, that one thing I want us to think of. Samuel was made the judge of that land by God. But Samuel is the one who is appointing his sons as the judges. You can think about it. I'm not going to deduce anything for you. The name of the first one was Joel, and the name of the second, Abiha or Abijah. Um, there were judges in uh, Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside from the, for after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. Then all the Israel, elders of Israel gathered together and called Samuel to Ramah. And he said to him, Look, you are old. Your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a church, make us a king to judge us like all the other nations. If you want to underline your Bible, that's the right place to underline. Make us a king like all other lands. So now what is it? The God who was supposed to be unique, we are bringing him down with what we are familiar to. We are bringing him down to our familiarity. Instead of us, this is where we see the downfall. Instead of us trying to explore him and trying to go to his height, we are trying to pull God to our level. We are still doing the same thing. We want God to work in our two-dimensional life when God himself is multi-dimensional. 
and he gave us the ability to walk in those mu in those in that multi-dimensional state rather than this two-dimensional state. Amen. So they they come to the conclusion they made a comparison. Okay, everybody else has a king, we don't have a king. So give us a Truth be told in the book in the book of Deuteronomy and in the in, in their in the in those books God himself says one day I will give them a king that will reign over them forever. He said he will give it. But now they are like okay, we saw all other people have it, now I need it. I want this. I want to see how this got this took place. How it happens, how man's will interrupts God's will. How God's, God has a plan, but man has a plan too. This is where we have to learn. Every single time we are seeking something, we are trying to pursue something, we have to learn to submit ourselves. Not my will, but your will. Your will might seem so justified. Your my will might even seem perfect. Jesus himself says that. If it is your will, God, take this cup away from me. He says that. He goes through the temptation like the same way we do. Yet, he ga gives us an example there, saying, nevertheless. He backs up and he says, not my will, but your will. He chooses the will of God about his will. And that's where the whole story changes. And that's what grace is about. That's what anointing is about. Choosing the will of God. Not my will, but your will. That is all this anointing is about. Anointing is all about that. Choosing his will about our will. Because you are anointed by him. If you want the anointing to work, you best be doing what he said, not what you want. Simple, isn't it? For me, if I put my logic there, it's like, okay, he's the one who hired me. I need to do his job, not my job. Nobody is going to pay me at work if I do my work. I have to do what they have hired me for. That's, a, that's the same thing with anointing. God has given that anointing to us so that we will do his will on this earth. Not our will. I'm, 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 I'm coming to, uh, uh, to an end here. We will go. But, the, but they, they asked that. But the thing displeased Samuel. When they said give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel. Heed the voice of the people. In all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you. But they have rejected me. That I should not reign over them. This is the place I want to take a pause. If somebody is rejecting the gospel, they are not rejecting you, but they are rejecting Christ himself. Don't take it personal when people are not getting here. Because they are not rejecting you, they are rejecting their God. So we have to we have to take we have to set ourselves away from it. I'm just a messenger. I'm gonna bring you the message. You won't don't want to respond? Okay, that's between you and your master. That's between you and your God. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That's what we have to commit ourselves to. Our job is to declare the gospel to everybody. Them receiving it or not is their job. Not our job. Our job is to teach the righteousness of the Lord to everybody. But if they, they're receiving it or not, is their job. Not my job. Amen. So in there, he goes, he goes, uh, um, the Lord, uh, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. They're not even understanding what they're asking. Many times we fall into that same trap. We don't know what we are asking for. The implication of it, if you clearly break it down, you will see, okay, you're saying, I don't want God to reign over me. I want some man to reign over me. 
And he, the beautiful thing I like, this is a beautiful, beautiful chapter if you can really study. Now therefore heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel told all the word of the Lord to the people who have asked him for a king. He said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take over your sons, appoint them uh, for his own chariots and to be his horsemen. Some will run for before the, his chariots. He will appoint captains. He's, he's telling everything. The same kids that are supposed to serve God are going to serve the man now. Is that what you want to choose? He's, he's clearly telling. He's clearly laying those things in front of them. Nobody would do that, isn't it? That's what our God is. God clearly lays uh, details in front of us. He puts everything. Behold, I put I before behold, I will I put life and death before you. He's the only one who can do that. He's the only one who boldly says, I'm putting life and death before you. Choose life that you may live. But he wa he says, I'm not gonna take away death, or I'm not gonna stop you from not choosing this. I'm gonna put everything before you. You know, in through that, God is showing a firm confidence in us that we are created in his image. So he goes on and explains to those things. And then comes the beautiful thing, this chapter. There was a man of Benjamin, ninth chapter, first verse, whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekorah, Bekorath, the son of Aphiah, a Benzamite, a mighty man of power. Okay? And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not more a handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. All right. Now I'm going to draw my first conclusion here about the ex-anointed. The first thing that I will say about him is he has every qualification to deserve it. He looks like he deserves it. He looks like he deserves it from a human mindset. He would be the right choice for that job. From a human perspective, it would be the best thing in your life from a human perspective. That's exactly what happens for Saul. He had all those qualifications that would please anybody. You know, he is taller than everybody. Everybody in Israel or will come just to his shoulders. During that time and era, people say average height of Israelites by the time was six feet. And those people are just going to come to his shoulders. He can only imagine how tall this guy would be. And he has everything that you can think of as a qualification. He had all the qualifications. That's the ex anointed. He loses the kingdom, isn't it? Down the line. But what kind of qualifications did the anointing have? We will study that later. But now we will stop with this guy. 